Hello, I'm Jeremy Jurgens, Managing Director at the World Economic Forum, and I'd like to thank all of our global audiences for joining us for this session on leading industry transformation. We've had a great uh, first day uh, of our inaugural Global Technology Governance Summit. Uh, we've uh, had worldwide coverage, uh, over 10 million uh, visitors, video views, and social media already in the first day. And I expect the second day to be even stronger with the rich program that we have. Today's session is extremely important as we look at the role that industry has to play in helping both shape and advance uh, you know, the broader objectives of improving technology governance. And I'd like to just call out three specific areas where the forum's contributing to this domain. First is our industry programs. We have a rich set of industry programs covering 20 industries where we look at the most pressing issues within each industry, whether that's in energy, in health, in manufacturing, or finance. In each of these sectors, we actively work with industry leaders to understand the critical issues, as well as on what needs to be done to address them. The second core element of our program is actually around global innovators and what we call technology pioneers. These are the companies that actually show us what's possible in the domain of transformation, how companies can improve, and it gives us a kind of a pulse on what we can expect and what can emerge before it happens. And the third area I'd like to bring attention to is our network of fourth industrial revolution centers, which are around the world. In today's session, we're co-hosting with our center uh, in Japan and our partner, the Asia Pacific Initiative. And these centers are important in actually prototyping and exploring what rolling out new technologies looks like on the ground in countries and cities around the world. So with that, I'm looking forward to an extremely engaging session and uh, welcome our contributors. And I'll hand over now to Dr. Funabashi. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before getting on to business, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude uh, to both uh, Professor Krash Schwab and Jeremy Jorgens for launching uh, this extremely uh, uh, visionary and uh, imaginative uh, platform of uh, meeting the finest minds from all over the world to explore how we should harness the fruits of the technologies while managing the risks. So uh, once again, I'm a great, uh, I'm very much uh, delighted to be, to be a part of this exercise. Thank you. Uh, Klaus Schwab, uh, Professor Schwab told us that when he uh, wrote a book about the fourth industrial revolution several years ago, uh, he thought that uh, 23 technologies were the key. So he identified 23 technologies as the pillars of the fourth industrial revolution. And that he thought at that time that it was, they were a science fiction at best. But it had become to be a reality. So in a way, we actually have been very much adept at harnessing and developing that technologies. But at the same time, we are not so sure to what extent we can manage to control the technology. For instance, a synthetic biology is one of those technologies. Uh, we now realize that, that uh, messenger RNA is the, really the key to fight against that COVID-19. At the same time, we are not so sure that vaccination could actually really will be that, that golden key to fight against that coronavirus. So we have a lot of questions uh, to be answered. 
We are extremely fortunate to have a stellar panelist today. Uh, I would like to introduce all the panelists. First, we have Governor Yuriko Koike, the governor of uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Thank you. Ms. Koike. Ms. Koike uh, was a TV newscaster. Uh, and uh, uh, she is an Arabist too. Uh, when she was a minister of the environment, she promoted a cool biz, a type of business style used to tackle global warming. She then went to become Japan's first female defense minister. Next is Jim Hageman Sunabe, chairman of Siemens as well as a member of the Board of Trustees at the World Economic Forum. He also is an adjunct professor at Copenhagen Business School. Prime Minister Brunavich. Uh, Brunavich is a Prime Minister of Serbia, and in that role has focused on digitization, education, public service, and economic reforms. He is known uh, for transforming the economy to move forward, one based on knowledge and innovation, while increasing average wages. Hansa de Dogen is chairwoman of uh, Hapsi Burudada and is a leading figure in Turkey's online and digital world, as well as philanthropist. She's also chairwoman of the Aydan Dogan Foundation which launched the Daddy Send Me School campaign that granted 50,000 scholarships to young girls and built 33 girls' dormitories across Turkey. I would like to uh, each panelist to make some brief opening remarks. First, let me turn to Governor Koike for her opening remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunabashi. Thank you for your kind introduction. And I'm very thankful for this opportunity to participate in the Global Technology Governance Summit with such honorable um, uh, participants of the world. It is a great pleasure and honor to participate in this meeting under the leadership of a current the president of World uh, Economic Forum, Mr. Brende, who was my trustworthy counterpart when he served as a Norway's Minister of the Environment, and I was Japan's Environment Minister. Now, this meeting, which connects speakers online from around the world, exemplifies the changes that have occurred in the world over this uh, past year. Now, with remote work and online meetings, uh, just like today, the pandemic has greatly changed the way we live and work, and it is reawakening us to the power of digital technology. And I believe that while upholding individual freedom and human rights, digital transformation must be inclusive, ensuring that no one is left behind in benefiting from it. And at the Tokyo government, we are also strengthening our system to promote digital transformation and launch the Bureau of Digital Services on this April. And in general, Japanese offices still lag behind and use of a lot of paper. So we place a little goat, little goat, yes, a stuffed animal in the bureau to get rid of all that paperwork by eating it. Now in Japan, there is a phrase from days of old, a martial arts concept known as Shingita. You know, of course, Dr. Munabashi about it. Shin means mind, gi means skill, and tai means body. Only by integrating these three elements can one, can, can one achieve their best performance. So let me apply for this concept to Tokyo, and Shin is the mind of the people, gi is technology, the theme of this summit, and tai 
is policy supporting both mind and technology. As a matter of fact, that, uh, as Dr. Um, Hunabashi introduced me by using the, the uh, very well-known campaign uh, of Kubis, Kubis all, has all these Shingi type, so it was so successful. Now, from this Shingi type perspective, I am now advancing measures for economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic, while also responding climate change and other challenges in order to ensure sustainable recovery, Tokyo's action for green recovery. Now, a large portion of a city's carbon emissions originate from buildings, achieving sustainable building uh, is a common challenge and goal for the world's cities. And in 2010, Tokyo launched the world's first urban cap and trade program requiring CO2 reductions at existing buildings, including office buildings. And in, in fiscal 2018, the covered facilities achieved reductions of as much as 27% compared to base year emissions, attracting a great deal of interest from New York and other cities. And Tokyo is also making it uh, mandatory for more than 30,000 small and medium-sized facilities to submit energy data and other such reports, as well as advancing efforts to facilitate online submissions. Such initiatives are drawing much attention from other cities, primarily from within Asia. And since 2019, Tokyo has also been providing Kuala Lumpur with policy support concerning measures for buildings. Now, digitalizing air quality monitoring data is also essential in raising the efficiency of environmental, environmental countermeasures. We will promote digital transformation of 21st century social infrastructure to ensure business continuity and create new businesses, even amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the world is confronting two major crises, the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate change. In order to overcome these crises, two crises, under the rallying uh, cry of time to act, Tokyo is rolling out a um, movement to accelerate climate action for the future. And Tokyo will search forward with digital transformation in order to create new value innovations for a sustainable recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor Koike. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Jim Snabe. Uh, Jim, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, honored to be on this panel and participating in this important uh, conversation. I have to admit that I would have loved uh, to be in, in, in Tokyo today. Uh, it's been a while since I went on a long trip. Um, it's not that I you know, necessarily promote out of travel, but I think it's time uh, we get together as human beings again in the same room and discuss. We will make it you know, digitally as well. Um, and let me say that I, um, I'm extremely thrilled about this discussion around industrial uh, transformation. In my opinion, we've seen the first wave of uh, digitization, which was really around consumer apps. It was around social media and entertainment. And while that was an important, uh, let's say, new set of tools, um, I think this next wave, which I call the industrial digitization, is uh, dramatically more valuable and therefore one that we should pay even more attention to. Um, it's the kind of transformation where we can solve the fundamental challenges that the world still has around uh, creating sustainable energy systems, uh, sustainable trans uh, transportation systems. We can create a, a much more um, uh, um, efficient manufacturing systems. Um, we will have uh, lifelong learning, uh, digitally supported um, and ideally um, healthcare systems that are more prevention oriented than uh, fixing diseases oriented. So many, um, I think high value opportunities when we take digital into an industrial context. Now for me, COVID was um, in, in many ways a disastrous moment and, and 
it caught us by surprise. But if there's a few things that I take from COVID, uh, first of all, it is our ability to transform rapidly as human beings. Um, I have not seen such a big transformation of human being behavior um, and, and, and tradition um, in such a short period of time. So what if we could take that uh, ability to transform more rapidly into the future and try and solve three problems to be with us after COVID-19? Uh, First of all, it's obvious to me that we will see an accelerated uh, digitization. And I think it's important that we realize that once we bring digital into industry and mission critical infrastructures, we need to have a much more responsible type of digitization where we do not steal people's privacy and where we create trust in digital technologies and not destroy trusts or democracies. So there's the first task. How do we use digital technologies in critical infrastructures in a trustful and responsible way? The second challenge that will come was already addressed, which is the need to accelerate climate action. Uh, before COVID, we discussed whether we could afford it. Um, now we have so much recovery funds coming into the economy that it seems like we have more than enough money. And the challenge will be to guide this money, not in building you know, ourselves back to before COVID, but to accelerate a more sustainable future, invest in infrastructures that accelerate sustainable energy transportation systems, et cetera. These are areas of investment where we not only create value in terms of growth and jobs, but also is the sustainability agenda accelerated. And my last challenge, and therefore I love also to see the politicians coming into this play is my concern around globalization. I think there will be a risk that we will reverse globalization as we've now been closing down countries for a while and kind of thought that worked well. Well, I can assure you as chairman of AP Miller Mask, the largest shipping company in the world, that the shops were still open. Um, and that was because global uh, value chain still worked. And we need to ensure that we don't try and nationalize or close down countries after COVID-19, but in fact, create more resilient uh, supply chains where we have not one source for our material, but multiple sources. This requires more complex value chains and hence a much more a collaborative uh, global trade. And so my hope is that we will see this opportunity as an opportunity to accelerate a responsible digital agenda, climate action, so that we get the future infrastructures up to play right now. And of course, collaboration around global uh, uh, trade so that we create opportunities for everyone in a, a better future. Those are my hopes, um, and I'll leave the floor to um, the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for sharing your insights with us. Um, uh, Prime Minister Brunovich, uh, we now invite you to make initial remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Funabashi. Uh, all the other panelists, it's a, it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to, to be with you today. And I would also uh, echo what my predecessor has said. That I'm hoping that soon enough we'll be able to uh, actually meet again um, uh, in conferences. I think, you know, before COVID, there were perhaps too, too, too many conferences. Right now, I, I miss traveling and I miss... Uh, really uh, talking to people um, live and face to face. But in any event, uh, I, I really thank you for uh, initiating this uh, important subject. I think the subject is, is uh, going to be of increasing importance as the world tries to overcome the effects of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, Serbia has placed uh, digitization and innovation as um, a number one priority in our future development and everything else that we do as, as the government in uh, Serbia. So five years ago, we have uh, decided to almost completely shift uh, uh, our uh, reform uh, priorities and the, the way we, we do things in Serbia. And there were three key areas uh, on which we focused specifically. One obviously was the economy and our goal was to go uh, from uh, 
investment-driven economy and mainly investment-driven economy mainly based on labor-intensive uh, investments where we needed to be because back in 20, 2012, uh, so about, about nine years ago, 10 years ago, uh, our, our uh, unemployment Of 25 percent, uh, it was staggering. It was uh, unbelievable. But but at that point in time, you know, our development goal was um, um, there to the economy, which is uh, uh, innovation driven and knowledge based, and digital and innovation basically was the cornerstone of that reform. The second key pillar, obviously, was education. Uh, we wanted to fully digitize our education. We are going to complete that process by 2022. So introducing uh, digital textbooks, um, uh, high-speed internet access in all the classrooms. Uh, um, in 2017, we made coding and programming a mandatory subject in our elementary school. And uh, this year, we are going to have the first generation of uh, school children leaving elementary school with uh, the knowledge of uh, uh, key uh, program languages, uh, Scratch, Python, Pygame, and, and Jupyter. Um, we wanted to focus on education in order to enable our youth to, to, to be prepared uh, for, the, for the jobs of the 21st century. But that really meant to teach them uh, how to think and not what to think. Uh, and the third key area really was government. So uh, introducing e-government, making all of the services that government provides to its citizens and to its businesses, all of it, make it electronic. Uh, that would cut, cut time, increase the efficiency of the government, increase transparency, transparency of the government. It would mean fighting corruption it would mean making the government fully citizen-centric. And then also, what is extremely important to me, it would also, di digitizing the government means that you make government available to its citizens and all of the businesses 24, uh, 7, 365 days a week. The government is basically available to, to its citizens. Um, so those were our three key pillars, and we have done a lot. And um, I think thinking about these things from the point of view of COVID-19 pandemic, I think that everything we have done in digitization, uh, and especially in these three key pillars, paid off during the pandemic. Uh, and I will tell you just a few examples. Economically, it made us... Uh, more stable and more resilient. Uh, we have focused on the services sector, ICT sector, startups, research and development, high tech. And actually, um, our ICT sector and services sector overall, but ICT sector in particular, as of 2017, started growing at uh, a rate of 25% and above year on year. So uh, when the pandemic uh, hit, we were more resilient. Our GDP decline in 2020 was only uh, 1%, and our GDP growth in 2019 was 4.2%. Uh, so uh, from quite a dynamic growth, the decline in 2020 wasn't, wasn't that, that uh, large, and in that respect, Serbia is going to be probably, we're waiting for the statistics from, uh, from all European nations, but probably uh, we're going to be between uh, first and second place in, in Europe. Um, in terms of education, because we were preparing to go digital and then, and then a lot of our textbooks were already digital, uh, we've trained uh, most of our teachers to go digital. When the pandemic struck, I think we were the only country in Europe that did not lose uh, even a single day uh, of schooling. So when we needed to go online, we finalized with kind of physical, physically going to school on, on Friday afternoon. Monday morning, everyone was already online. Um, 
our net employment in 2020 grew because the employment in the ICT sector grew by some 14.5 percent. I mean, it's not all about digital. Obviously, we have provided a very strong support, fiscal support to, to our economy during the pandemic, but going digital really helped us. So we overall, the net employment, even uh, faced with the pandemic grew. And finally, our public services continued uninterrupted. And even things which uh, a year ago, needed to be uh, done physically, such as in, enrolling uh, kids to kindergartens or schools, were able to go fully digital and, and fully electronic uh, during the pandemic. So in that respect, uh, the, uh, the, the, the government services did not change a lot. We were prepared for the pandemic. So overall, digitization pays off, and especially when faced uh, in, with crises such as, such as this one. Um, it also helped us um, um, in a successful mass immunization campaign, but I can tell you a little bit more about it in the, in the, uh, in the future or when we talk about, about these things in the follow-up questions. And finally... In artificial intelligence and life sciences in general, I think that will that will be the focus of much of the investments, and will that is where I think the competitiveness of countries, smaller countries like Serbia, lies lies in. So the transformation continues in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, uh, Hanzade. Uh, it's your turn uh, to make your initial remarks. Thank you, Dr. Tuna Bashi. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today, especially together with inspiring uh, women leaders like Prime Minister Branovic and Governor Yuriko, as well as our other panelists. Um, there is no doubt that the pandemic accelerated the adoption of technology in many ways, from increase in e-commerce penetration to the usage of video conferences. At Hepsi Burada, we lived through all uh, these transformations at their full intensity within the first few weeks of the pandemic. For those of you who might not know, Hepsi Burada, which means everything is here, uh, is the leading e-commerce platform in Turkey. Our vision is to lead digitalization of commerce. We manage a large ecosystem with more than 50,000 merchants, 30 million users, almost half of the adult population in our country. As a super app, we go well beyond standard e-commerce. We provide instant grocery deliveries under Hipsy Express. We provide uh, flight tickets under Hipsy Fly. And we also enabled easy online payment solutions under our brand Hepsi Pay. Uh, if I step back and tell you what I think the, the pandemic fundamentally uh, changed in our world or the major three trends that I see uh, triggered by the pandemic, the first I would say a need uh, to rebalance between efficiency versus resilience and scalability emerged. Pandemic made many, for many businesses, slow down the, the growth. But on the other hand, for most of the tech companies, we've experienced an immense uh, surge within days. And if, if, at Epsi Burada, if our platform, our tech platform, when we were building, if we were only focused on efficiency and not on resilience and scalability, there is no way we would have uh, managed to able uh, to serve that uh, increase in demand. At the same uh, way, on our operations, we had to double our workforce within a few weeks. And we had the systems to enable us to scale our workforce without compromising any health and safety issues. 
So our focus when we run our businesses, efficiency versus resilience and scalability, a slight rebalancing might be needed. The second uh, trend I, I see is an acceleration of convergence between online and offline world. And also uh, it, there is a rising consensus that the two world will and should coexist. Like all the, all the esteemed panelists before me suggested that we would, we, Zoom meetings are very efficient, very good, but we all miss to be uh, together in the same room. And online uh, school is useful, but for the well-being of all of us, we the kids need to go back to, to school. And at the same time, yes, e-commerce platforms like Hepsi Burada is essential for, for our lives today. We can't live without uh, those platforms, but we also miss offline retail. So the two worlds will coexist in my view and the pandemic has uh, underlined this trend. The third and for me the most important awareness and change that the pandemic showed us, I would say uh, there is a, 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 a change happened in our perception and expectations from technology and from the tech companies. Pre-pandemic, we were all inspired by the disruptive power of technology. E-commerce disrupts retail. FinTech disrupts banking. Uh, you know, autonomous, uh, autonomous cars. So technology will come and eliminate certain industries. At Hepsi Burada, we've never been about disruption. From our funding, we always said it's about co cooperation and being an enabler. But I think during pandemic, now there is a bigger social awareness that we, we, we want tech power to be more inclusive. We want tech power to act as an enabler rather than saying, I am eliminating all these industries. I think this is very important. And that can only happen if you have the right values in your companies, it can't just, we can't just change that mindset through regulations or only having bigger government. Corporations have those values in themselves. It, you know, the social awareness or social responsibility has never so when the pandemic, when the first case happened in Turkey, our initial reaction was how do we uh, secure the well-being of our employees? We've provided uh, all necessary PPEs, we've increased our service buses to, to provide, to have social distancing. We increased the number of shifts so fewer people were on our fulfillment centers. And we made sure we communicate our essential workers that their well-being becomes, you know, before everything else. At the same time, we stood by our merchants as well. At the peak of the pandemic, when all the shopping malls and retailers were closed, our merchants, our brands and retailers relied on our platform to survive. And we lowered our commissions to one third of what we would usually charge to support them. As well. And it gave us to show our true uh, character. And I'm proud that we rise to the occasion. And I believe this new, the need of new a social contract in a way between corporations and society is an area we will need to give more uh, attention and discuss uh, further post pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I was so much in, uh, inspired by uh, Hanzade's remarks. So I, I really would like to change that order uh, asking the question. Hanzade, uh, so, uh, how then uh, do you uh, compete with uh, a global platform? Uh, and you 
strongly believe in resilience and uh, 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 as a national platform, uh, you have uh, some very much uh, 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 variable things to you know, protect and defend and yeah. to uh, compete with that global platform. But how, how to do that? Yes, sure. That, that, does that uh, still, uh, the national platform as such still exist, can exist? in face of the presence of the global platform? Sure. I mean, Hepsiburada is a rare example of a national champion. I mean, you have Rakuten in Japan, but it, Turkey is a very competitive market. Amazon and Alibaba, they're active here. So how do we compete with these two global giants? A lot of things. I mean, first, um, our, we are a household name our brand is associated with trust so it's not all about uh, only about selection and competitive prices but our quality of service is unmatched in the market we we do frictionless return which you know doesn't even happen in many of the western countries our customers can just click and we take care of the return because for us i always tell my team not provide we have to go beyond what they have on their platforms to so that we can keep our customers happy and they don't need any others but we do see national champions emerging more and more and i yeah so you know we've been we've been in the market for a very long time uh, we are a household name and we keep growing the market Thank you, Hanzade. Jim, uh, you are the chairman of two uh, very much revered uh, companies, uh, which history stretched back over more than 100 years, Siemens and AP Mola Moscow. Uh, how do you keep this competitive edge uh, in this age of global uh, fourth industrial revolution uh, uh, as maintaining uh, simultaneously that uh, traditional heritage. And also, I'm wondering how you really can uh, overcome the difficulty of uh, carrying over the legacy, uh, uh, legacy industry, which usually abhors uh, at uh, a disruption, uh, quote unquote, breaking things. Well, thank I think this is a wonderful question and uh, one that's important that we can answer. I mean, Siemens is 174 years old uh, and Maersk is 117 years old. Um, and so, you know, you don't get to be that old in the industry world um, unless you have an ability to constantly reinvent yourself. Um, and that has happened in both of these uh, very significant companies. Um, now, what we have seen over the, let's say, 200 years of industrialization is a quest for scale, which was really driven by the idea that if you produce more of the same, it gets cheaper by the margin. And therefore, size was an important uh, way to compete and survive over years. And both companies have uh, done that really well. I think the fourth industrial revolution is about speed, not size. In fact, size could become an inhibitor. And uh, you know, a dear colleague on the panel previously mentioned this disruption. We've kind of been falling in love with these startups that destroy industries. And, and, and I think there's a, a danger in that because many people lose their jobs every time that happens. So, so at least I have taken on it with my leadership to help large companies accelerate their innovations, become much more fast and much more focused and leverage the fact that they actually master the physical world. I think we're running out of products where you can replace the physical product with a digital product like we did with music and, and videos and, and even meetings and money. 
and we still need uh, wind turbines and cars and, and we need buildings and we need infrastructures. And, and so what if we could take those um, very esteemed old companies and give them more focus? You've seen how we've broken up Siemens in three Siemens companies to get more speed and focus. The same is true with Maersk. And add a digital dimension. I truly believe that if you master hardware and software in the next phase of this transformation, you will be one of the winners. And that's what we're trying to do with, with Siemens and Maersk. And so far with, with great results. And my last comment would be, which was also mentioned and, and one of the key discussions at the forum as well, stakeholder orientation, not just shareholder orientation. How do we make sure that we deliver value to all our stakeholders, including society and the planet at large, which is a new agenda where I think the old companies have an important role to play in order for us to create a better future. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister Vrnovich, um, actually, I, I have to confess that I did not know that much about uh, such an excellent performance that Serbia has uh, demonstrated uh, in coping with a uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. But uh, how could the other countries possibly learn from the Serbia uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, fighting against that uh, COVID? I don't know. As, as I said, you know, my, my uh, uh, key uh, takeaway is that really, as I said already, digitization pays off. Uh, I mean, by, by going digital uh, in terms of uh, government, uh, for example, you know, you basically do what you uh, would do uh, if you were CEO of a company. You make government more efficient, you make it more transparent. And, and, you know, you build trust with people because people see that, you know, you're basically available to them, as I said, 24-7, 365 days, days a year. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, in, terms, in terms of economy, again, we, we got quite early on that, uh, that we need to change. And obviously, it's easier for a country like Serbia because we really needed to change. Uh, change. And we were forced uh, into uh, change. There are other countries that are much more stronger, especially the, the EU countries that are much more stronger. And then they do not have that drive to change because they are doing fantastic regardless. I think that is something that is their competitive disadvantage. And they will, they will pay for that reluctance to change in the future. In Serbia, we have started, you know, quite quite a, a uh, big reforms. I think those are, those those were very systematic, very structural reforms. In terms of how how do we see our economy? Where do we see our competitive advantage? How do we empower our people? What kind of government we want to to have? And I think people just need to. To, to, to think pragmatically and see how the world changes and then try to, to, to change with it or become the leaders of that change. And finally, you know, I, I'm always in terms of e-government and we talk about, when we talk about climate change, uh, we, a lot of countries uh, think about climate change and how we, what we can do in terms of environmental protection, but they never, start from the government uh, with simple things. And I've counted, for example, when we started introducing e-government, that, that was precisely on 1st of June, 2017. Uh, so about four years ago, when we started introducing the first electronic services. To this date, small Serbia, which has about 7 million inhabitants, uh, only because of e-government, the government has uh, saved uh, more than 180 million papers, A4 papers, uh, that we would otherwise issue to each other or to citizens or to businesses. If you translate that into trees and, uh, and water and electricity that is needed to, to produce this 180 million papers, that would mean that we have saved as of 1st of June 2017 to this day, 900 tons of paper, which is 18,000 trees which is more than 76 million liters of water, which is more than 6,000 megawatt hours of electricity. 
And that is small Serbia. Can you imagine if bigger countries or, for example, the EU administration went into e-government, what kind of impact that would have for environment and climate? Thank you. Governor Koike, uh, you have been the front line of uh, tackling with uh, COVID-19 more than a year. And you, gain, you have gained a, a very much solid respect uh, from uh, the uh, you know, uh, metropolitan uh, dwellers for your leadership. How do you uh, see that further need to uh, fight against the COVID by harnessing that digital transformation specifically. Do you have any plans or uh, initiatives in the coming months? Thank you very much, Dr. Hunabashi. Uh, let me explain our vision for Smart Tokyo. Uh, our vision for uh, Smart Tokyo is to make the entire city smart and create a society where all things are uh, connected by IoT. For example, by utilizing autonomous uh, driving, energy demand control, and other means, the power of digital technologies will allow the people of Tokyo to lead high quality lives. And at the same time, it will build an eco-friendly society. Now, with regard to new digital technology measures, from the perspective of user friendliness, I believe that people should not have to adjust to digital technologies. These technologies should be adjusted to people to ensure accessibility by all citizens of Tokyo. Now, Tokyo is a mega city, as you know, with a population of some 14 million people. And Greater Tokyo, which is Tokyo and its surrounding prefectures, is an enormous area with 36 million residents. A defining feature of this area is our extensive public transit system. And I'm sure you've heard of the clockwork precision of our intricate network of rail railway, uh, uh, railway lines and subways were quick to digitalize operations. And Turkey also provides open data on public transport has made an app available, which notifies users of the location of trains and any changes in train operations in real time. This power of digital technology is also being applied in the new normal created by the pandemic. And for example, this app enables commuters to avoid crowded times on trains. Now, by implementing innovative in-depth policies, we aim to make Tokyo uh, the world's destination of choice. And as we deliberate policies for Tokyo's future, we will also include the perspective of a sustainable recovery while aiming to restore the economy, society, and mindset of the people which have been exhausted by the COVID-19 crisis. And this recovery will also look to the future to make Tokyo a strong city, a strong, sustainable digital city. We have responsibility to pass down a healthy planet for the well-being of the future generations. I'm very much inspired, by the way, by um, Serbian uh, Prime Minister by reducing uh, use of paper. So, uh, the, the, the so I'd like to send you this to Serbia. <laughs> Let's work <Good> together. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. What are the biggest challenges and risks uh, ahead? as we are now being driven uh, to uh, this industrial uh, transformation. Uh, to survive, all business will have to become to be a tech company. Uh, that's fact of life. And that's perhaps a part of that new dynamics of this industrial uh, transformation. Uh, and we know that digital transformation particularly uh, uh, will uh, usher in a, a new era of big promise 
big frontier and big opportunities. But at the same time, we have to be mindful of the pitfalls. So uh, in the interest of time, I would like uh, each of you to uh, share your insight in one minute on this question, the biggest challenge and or the biggest risks ahead. First, Jim, would you? Well, thank you very much. Um, I truly believe that this is a leadership moment where the excitement on technology needs to move into a human-centric approach. Um, I think we've had 200 years of trying to make uh, people work like machines. Now we can do the machines uh, uh, do that. And, and it, it's truly, I think, a remarkable moment in history where we need a different uh, leadership model in my mind. One that is allowing people to be more creative, be um, unleashed, so to say, and, and not plan too much because innovation and speed of innovation becomes the key to unlock the potential of technology. So I'm super excited about the phase we're in now. And uh, I think it's a leadership moment where we all should take a responsible and stakeholder oriented approach uh, to create a better future. Thank you. Thank you. Prime Minister Bramovich. I 100% I agree with Jim. I, I think it's, uh, in my view, still education. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we need to come up with, uh, with uh, uh, different models uh, for education. And we in Serbia are, are really focused on that very much. Or we are trying to, 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 to see how to do it. But the models which will empower people, which will, which will uh, release their creativity, um, and, and, and I think that is something that, that will be very challenging for us because where we are today, we don't really know uh, what will the future uh, uh, demand of these young people. So again, I, I think it's education. Great, thank you. Hanzade? Uh, please unmute, please. Sorry, I echo Prime Minister's and Jib's remarks. The, for me, the biggest challenge is how do we keep technological innovation uh, at pace while making it more inclusive? And how do we ba rebalance that power between technology and individual? And how do we embed it in our values for more responsible development of innovations? Thank you. Thank you very much. Jim? Yeah, yeah you, you already don't answer. Thank you very much. Governor Koike. Yes. Uh, well, we are now at unprecedented and historic turning point as we confront challenges, including the economy, climate change, the demographic shift, and the COVID-19 crisis. And let us harness the power of digital technology for innovation and value, value creation and overcome the present crisis to achieve a sustainable recovery. There is no time to lose. We must accelerate our actions and it is now the time to act. And this, um, this panel gave me a... a very good inspiration in order to challenge against the COVID-19 and, and create a new society in Tokyo utilizing um, digital, digital a power of digitalization and so forth. Thank you very much, for, uh, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Koike. Uh, we have uh, 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 several questions from the audience. Uh, let me introduce, uh, in the interest of time, just two of them. First, this is a question from uh, Mohammed Hamza, uh, a Pakistani uh, politician. How do we make sure that standards drive interoperability and responsive use of tech in a highly divided West and East? Uh, in other words, that uh, the confrontation and competition between the United States and China, uh, primarily. Uh, this is a question to Jim. Well, 
thank you. I think it's a very important question. And I do see a risk, like also um, uh, Mohammed is uh, suggesting here, that we'll have a divided digital future, which is not good for the uh, uh, prosperous uh, and opportunities that we have. Uh, um, I would just remind us that we've tried to solve such problems before. I mean, we have global aviation happening where we can fly to anywhere in the world, at least after COVID someday, where we have agreed on some international regulations on how to do that. I, you know, I'm chairman of the largest shipping company in the world. We move a million containers from every country in the world to every country in the world. And also there we have international regulations and standards on how to do that. And, and, and it is obvious that the next big infrastructure is the digital infrastructure. It started as a global infrastructure called the internet. We put a protocol on top of it for the World Wide Web, and it has gone way beyond what we had imagined. Now we begin to use that technology for mission critical infrastructures, everything from energy to healthcare. And that's the moment when we need global collaboration to set governance right and make sure that we use data without stealing people's privacy, that we use platforms without creating monopolies and that we use AI and still stay in control as human beings. Those I think are the three questions that we need. And then we need interoperability across all of these platforms. We're moving from what I called um, ego uh, systems, where you know um, um, everyone was trying to create value for themselves to eco systems, where we're creating impact for a better future. That I think is the mindset we need. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for your excellent answer. Uh, next question is from Sergey Netizin, a professor at uh, Wharton School. Of University of Pennsylvania. The question is that traditional companies like retail, travel, and events were negatively, negatively impacted by pandemic. Do they need to be helped? Or do you see their decline as expected and normal part of transformation? Uh, this is a, a question uh, to Hanzadi. It, yes, I mean, I know I'm. I am in on in on the better side of the of the things because e-commerce got the tail uh, wind uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I believe any company who was striving pre-pandemic, it can be a hotel chain or it can be a retail, will and does survive pandemic. So it will get hurt. Uh, but it will survive. Any company, a brand that had a lot of difficulties pre-pandemic will not survive even with the government's help. So I do believe there needs to be support and help, uh, but we shouldn't make pandemic a cover for a business that wouldn't survive anyway. That's my answer. Thank you. Great answer. Okay, I would like each of you to make uh, just one or two words, uh, final comment. Uh, first, uh, Prime Minister Privilege. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, the, the only final comment that I can make is, uh, you know, from the point of view of a politician, but also of a, of a, of a citizen of one European nation, is that I think that also pandemic uh, uh, taught us that we need more uh, multilateralism and that we need to go back to multilateralism. If we, if we did that, I think everyone at this point in time would be uh, uh, much differently positioned, especially with regards to vaccines. So I think that, you know, however we look at the world, uh, the politics, the economy, let's, let's just uh, uh, all together work more on multilateralism rather than, than, than uh, each, each uh, country standing for its Thank you. Jim? You know, I very much agree and was my same point. I wrote a piece on LinkedIn, which I called from the age of disagreement to the age of collaboration. I, for me, it's like we have this unbelievable opportunity. The technology is there to solve the biggest problems that humanity ever had. And we might be wasting it in our attempt to be disagreeing. And so it's time to come together to focus on the right problems. We know the problems, there are 17 of them, uh, defined by the United Nations, and we have the technologies to solve them. So let, let's collaborate to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Hanzadi, just one word. 
Yes, more cooperation, less disruption. More cooperation, thank you. Finally, Governor Koike. Yes, as I mentioned, uh, let us harness the power of digital technology for innovation and value creation and overcome the press, uh, present crisis, two crises, pandemic and uh, cli uh, climate uh, crisis uh, to achieve a sustainable recovery and no time to lose. So uh, let's work together. Time to act. Thank you. Time to act. Thank you very much. Once again, I really, really appreciate you sharing your precious time and thoughts and insight with us. Thank you very much. And then thank you very much for all that uh, the uh, audience uh, to join this session.